All right, well, um, hello everyone again. Sorry to interrupt. I know we just finished the long session, but we have the live cases on, so we don't want to get late for the, for the lab. We're going to go to the University of Washington, and we have Dr. Bill Lombardi, who has some uh, a great CTO case. But before we actually go to Dr. Lombardi, we're going to go back to the structural case that was done from, uh, by Dr. Riesman earlier on today and just gives us the result. It was a great case for those of you who've been in the structural room and we'll have to see the final result. So, Mark, uh, good afternoon or good morning for you. Hi, good afternoon. So, before we introduce the team here, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Mackinson and allow him to just to finish off the structural case. It would take about five minutes and then Perfect. we'll begin the second session. Burkhardt, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to show some of the images from uh, where we started, where we left you, and then the final results. So here we go. We have uh, the live screen up. Yeah, it's sort of. Yeah, it's sort of All right, so it's, it's as we it's, it's looked small. at the case initially. Perfect. It's a little yes. weird. The way it's strengthening. Is that the way you want it? It's okay. It's all right. Okay, perfect. Um, do you see the uh, posterior P3 and P2 prolapse? that we were dealing with. Uh, as you recall, we had a significant um, regurgitation orifice with that. I'm going to show you some images. This was the uh, PISA in the posterior medial commissure. Certainly very difficult in terms of the perpendicularity that we had to approach this with. And then to remind you of where we left, essentially had placed this first clip all the way into the commissure. I'm going to show you the situation after that first clip. The clip uh, at this point was actually released, and you can see it there in the commissure, leaving a small posterior medial commissure opening behind that clip. Now what you see here at the bottom is the second flail and prolapse. That was then what we uh, tried to treat next. So let me uh, show you how we approach that. Again, for the question of perpendicularity, as you know, it's very hard to get the prolapse and have an anterior and posterior leaflet at the same time. So as you see here, which was not the ideal situation, let me uh, point out, the uh, second clip with uh, one of our first grasps came in more, more lateral, more in the center of the valve. And if you carefully look, you see here, just uh, medial to it, the remaining prolapse that comes up. So we still had significant MR at that point and not satisfied with our show result. That, show that with the arrow over part. So let me uh, put the arrow up again. So here's the prolapsing element between the first clip and then this uh, first graph of our second clip. So we had to change our orientation even more, make it more counterclock, and freeing up a little bit from that first clip in order to get the anterior leaflet over here and then grasp the yep. posterior leaflet right there where it's prolapsing and showing you. that flail aspect. Now, um, you can see the situation with the clip orientation. Uh, the gain is down in order to show the clip clearly in the ventricle and its orientation. And then I'm going to move forward to show you our grasp. So you tried to grasp before this happened or you just waited to get the perfect orientation first before doing the actual clip, deploy, uh, clip uh, closing? So we did two grasps that did not get this flare element. And I want you to pay attention, if you could, to this particular image. And it's kind of showing the entire grasp. At the beginning, you see to the left-hand side, posteriorly, the flail and the prolapse. And it's falling into the posterior clip arm. And then the grippers are coming down, and then the clip is being closed towards the end really showing the orientation then appropriate and a good result. Take it from there, that's the uh, commercial view. And at this point, we no longer see the prolapse come up behind the clip here, which we previously saw. Uh, looking at the on-fuss at that, at that point, 
before releasing the clip. And then I'm going to show you the images when we had looked for pulmonary venous flow well? this, uh, at that this, uh, moment. Uh, Here's the clip situation and, uh, before releasing it. Yeah, and the pulmonary venous flow it's showed a right, like a change to a completely red flow into the LA. Now with almost normalized pulmonary venous flow on the left side, remind you this was previously a uh, systolic reversal. Again here the uh, I come to view, and now the clip actually is, if I turn this, uh, the clip is, has actually been uh, deployed. And I'll show you some final images. Again, this is now after deploying. And we look at color. Now the color that is remaining is all lateral to these two clips. And we had a discussion uh, in the question of treating that, but felt like that it was uh, not as dense, not as uh, impressive as of an MR. We did actually assess the ostium for the lateral commissure, as you see here with 3D, and it came out as 3.6, so in theory this patient could probably tolerate a third clip because there's still a tremendous lateral ostium but I want you to know that there's also actually, despite the first clip being so medial, there's still a medial commissure as well. And the gradient actually at this point was one, so we could in theory treat this patient further. Final results, again, this is the lateral jet only. There was nothing coming out um, medial. There's maybe another commercial view here to show you. That's the remaining MR. And the left dated pressure mark, I think uh, it was right, it was kind of cut in half from 30. Yeah, so the left atrial, the V weight was 35, cut down to 12. So we were and with the same blood pressure and I mean, that's volume right. status. So we company, thought that was a think, uh, tremendous uh, uh, result. Of this very nice uh, on my shoulder Here's Perfect. the last image of a 3D is color that on fuzz. I play that. 4C, uh, and you about that device? 4C. If I rotate this. You can see it's, that uh, the jet was, originates lateral of these two clips. Uh -huh. The two clips being here and here, and completely having captured the pathology, which was the collapsing elements of P2 and P3 over here. They're all working in the. X also sort of suggests the following blood atrial pressures, pulmonary venous flow, and what's important for the patient. I think that's what we did in this case. So, Burghardt, thank you for your spectacular work in imaging and guidance in the case. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Is there any questions for Dr. Mackinson? So I must say, you know, have the coronary panel here, so we probably don't want, the, don't want our questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Nobody understands anything. That was the mitral valve, by the way. But, the, but so I, I think we got that part. Yeah. But I think yeah. it's a phenomenal result again. Thank you so much. I think it was a great result. So excellent, uh, excellent work. Let me wake up Bill. Bill, we're going to start the case. Oh, okay. Good stuff. Hey, I just want to introduce the team here. We have Jose, Kate Curdy, who's our interventional cardiology fellow, Mark Reisman, obviously, and then Bill Lombardi, who uh, needs no introduction other than I, I'm just uh, pleased I can help him during this, uh, this procedure. Um, and then we have our crew who I'll introduce uh, during the rest of the uh, case, but I'll let uh, Kate start off, if that's okay, Bill? Absolutely. And, and present the case. Uh, case, and we'll get to work, and we'll got, have a lot of time. i got three vessels to fix, we're getting working. Yeah. Perfect. So, so, let me introduce you to the panel here. I think you know pretty much everyone. We have uh, next to me Mick Vo, is here from um, from Alberta. Then we have Nick uh, Burke from uh, Minneapolis Heart, and then we have Nick Lembo from Colombia, Farouk Jaffer from uh, uh, Colum from uh, Mass General, then Mauricio Cohen from University of Miami, and uh, uh, and Stefan Rimfrey from uh, uh, Montreal. So you have um, a, a large group of uh, people who are very excited to see your case. So, Kate, if you discuss uh, this case, hopefully we'll get to do lots of uh, potential learning here for those in the audience and ourselves. Kate? Great. Excellent. Um, so this is a 78-year-old gentleman with a history of non-insulin-dependent diabetes, peripheral and coronary arterial disease, uh, notable with carotid artery disease, who presented last April with unstable angina. His echo was notable for a normal EF and no significant valve disease. On angiography, he was found to have shown a culprit lesion in apical LED, as well as an instant CTO of his OM1 out of the circ, 
um, and RCA CTO. He was briefly considered for cabbage, but thought best um, not to necessarily warrant a lima due to the apical location of his LAD lesion, uh, and has had ongoing angina despite medical therapy, and is hence referred here for revascularization today. So I just thought this would be an interesting case to discuss. So here's a gentleman, by the AUC is green. He's got three vessel disease, and he was initially referred to surgery. <coughs> surgery felt he wasn't a good candidate. He was then referred for medical therapy. And then eventually, after continuing to have symptoms, uh, was referred here to discuss uh, potential treatment options. Uh, and we'll go quickly through his films so you can see his anatomy, because that will so to illustrate some of this. So if we show the uh, florals. So, I'm gonna uh, make sure, here we go. So this is sort of highlights, you can see he's got a dual osteo left vein. He's got a stent in his sort of second OM that is totally occluded. And then he's got, you can see the apical LAD lesion out there into a fairly large wraparound LAD. Um, I don't give you the proximal right pictures, but we'll show that eventually. And then these are the collaterals in the apical ID lesion showing that he's got an occluded right coronary artery. So he, he has three vessel disease, significant ischemia, significant angina, despite medical therapy. He was told that the LAD was too small to stent, um, as well as potentially the OM, even though it's already got a stent, and that he did need the CTO fix. So just sort of a good presentation of care variability. Um, I've got a, a lot of things here because my plan is to leave him hopefully with a residual syntax score under eight, so I'm gonna treat the apical LED, then treat the CERC uh, OM, and then treat the right coronary CTO. And if all goes well, we're gonna do all of that live, if you guys are good with it. Um, if you'd like to start having some of the discussions about this, if you're okay with me just going ahead and take care of the LED while the panel discusses this or has questions, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, perfect, Bill, that's awesome, that's a phenomenal case. Uh, I'm a little disappointed you only have two CTOs in this one to deal, so. They will be done very quickly. Uh, so uh, maybe we just start with me and can just say your thoughts about you know what you do in this patient. Do you think it would be a bypass patient? Would you de would you um, change the sequence of events? Do the different parts of the vessel or not? Or what, what were your thoughts? So this patient uh, appears to have multi vessel. However, it's not uh, the syntax score. I don't think is very high here. Um, there's issues in terms of the actual syntax score when you have a CTO uh, lesion because uh, we times five for the CTO lesion, but there's data from Philippe Genereau saying if you actually treat it as a regular lesion, the CTO doesn't contribute that much to the, to the overall, overall score. So I think this patient doesn't have high syntax score. I think it's reasonable to uh, proceed for it with, uh, with PCI. In terms of where you PCI and leaving a residual less than eight, I think doing the LED, which is a very uh, big apical uh, segment, doing that, and the RSA CTO, and leaving the actual OM bifurcation CTO. I think that would not be unreasonable, because the vessel is very small, and you got a bifurcation off that uh, OM as well. And you're gonna have higher restenosis rate. So I would go with the LAD and the RCA first, see how the patient does symptomatically. Sure. Nick, Nick would, you, would you say this is a small LAD? I mean, it looks pretty good size, but would you? Uh, I, I don't think- Two Nicks, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, you know, it's not a small LAD, it's an important LAD, and that's <clears throat> really a wraparound LAD with a, a posterior ascending as much as anything. It's almost codominant that that provides part of the inferior wall there. I think it's vital to do that uh, apical LAD, and that easily could be producing significant ischemia and well of, as well as the symptoms. The other two vessels, uh, clearly, I kind of uh, agree with Min. Um, I mean, ultimately, Bill's, Bill's right, the lower the syntax score, in, in all likelihood, the, the, and the complete revascularization certainly trumps uh, <clears throat> incomplete revascularization. So it's kind of a dealer's choice here. Um, I think in the hands of somebody like Bill who can do this in one setting, uh, that's a, a reasonable consideration. Perfect. Um, and, then, and then in terms of the sequence, uh, Nick uh, Lembo gets this time. So Nick says that potentially we could do the right coronary. I don't think we've seen the native right uh, in terms of the proximal part. Um, Bill, I don't know if the proximal part of the right is like a proximal RCA distal, do we? Um, maybe I missed it. If, the proximal right coronary. Uh, but is it a long occlusion, short occlusion? How does the right um, look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a, you'll see it. It's, there's no ambiguity. It's less than 20 millimeters. It has a huge landing zone and great collaterals. Great. So, they so, have a channel through it. Sure. So, the so, thing actually is that if we wire it as we rotoblade it. Okay, perfect. So, so Nick, uh, Nick, so would you just start with the right, then, as Minho was saying, versus going to the OM and leave the more complex OM, which is a 
bifurcation or trifurcation for later on, or would you just go in the OM since you are there anyway? I, I would I would do what Bill's doing right now and do do the LAD first, and, and then right sounds easier. And if I were going to do the second vessel in this setting, I'd do the right next. Okay. And the only other thing I noticed in, is on that first uh, AP cranial shot, there looked like there was a significant lesion in that first diagonal, which was a big vessel. You know, it's, a, it's an osteal diagonal. I, I would maybe want to FFR that to see that. That's not kind of in a, in a great area to do. Um, let's see if you see that there. So there is that osteal diagonal, but that's right. going to involve you getting involved with the proximal LAD bifurcation probably. I don't know if that's worth it, but it would be nice to know what the FFR of that was. But I think I'd do LAD, FFR, the diagonal, and then do the right. And then depending on the time and the contrast, make a decision on the circumflex, whether to do it all in one setting. Sure. And, and I guess I don't know if you have maybe other views. Maybe the diagonal may not be a slight in other views. But I see your point. It looks uh, definitely a large vessel. It might be worth uh, assessing at least as well. Um, Maybe, maybe Farouk can touch a little bit on the basics. I see Bill is coming in, probably a big guide in terms of the basics um, of getting complex PCI like this and CTO PCI. So, Bill, is that the Nate French guide that you have? Yeah, it's Nate French guide just because of the CTO. Stefan can yell at me. I thought about doing radial femoral. Um, it chose to go femoral femoral just because I'm lazy, I'll admit it. Um, about most of my cases, where it would be radial femoral. So the, the point I want to make as I'm doing this LID was trying to be, as Nick Lembo has grilled into me, as being a good stenter. So instead of just going out and trying to do a, a weak job in that distal ID, we pre dilled it with a 2.5 balloon, we put a 2.5 stent, and then we post dilated it with a 2.75 balloon. And though you can primary stent a lot of this stuff and sort of underemploy stents, and they look angiographically good, and you can get away with it in the cath lab, the long-term outcome, the restenosis rates and other event rates are higher if we don't do that. And so I think it's really important as stenters that we actually go back to the older days where we do a much better job of vessel prep, stent deployment, and post dilatation. So not only do we get good short-term pretty pictures, but good long-term outcomes for the patients. And as someone very close to me once told me, is, remember, we're only spending 10 minutes here. This patient's going to live with this stent for the rest of their life. So it really is important for us to make sure that stent goes in well. So we're going to take a picture here, if you can fill it up. And if this looks good, then I'm going to go ahead and turn my attention to the circumflex. Nick, I think your comment on the diagonal is important. Um, and I will tell you is if we have time, we'll have to for yeah, it at the end, or we'll see how we go symptomatically. Because my issue with diagonals is I do not want to put this guy's LAD in play for a diagonal. I worry about that. I'm going to be very right, careful. Right. And that could be a bonus if uh, at the end of the procedure if we're able to. Thank you, mean it. Beautiful. That's great. So that's a great result. So we're going to move our attention now onto the circumflex. It's a big transatlantic well idea, also. Perfect. Thanks, Bill. And then I guess that's a, what you just mentioned is very important early on. And sometimes in these long, complex CTOs, you get too focused on getting the crossing done with the wire. And then once the crossing is done, then just want to get it done as soon as possible. And sometimes we want to do as, as good a job as we could, post dilating the stand, make it look as good as possible. Um, uh, so maybe go, uh, going back to the, um, uh, to the basics again, I think the basics are most important for getting success and safety, actually. So, Farouk, what are your thoughts about, you know, femoral, bifemoral? I think that's what I personally do, but your thoughts on bifemoral, eight friends, large guides, and for complex cases like this? Sure. So certainly um, one large femoral-based um, access is, is usually necessary um, in most cases um, for eight French. But if you're very skilled, and Stefan will comment on this, on, the, on getting eight French sheets into the radial artery, that is a possibility. In terms of the second axis, I think it really depends on the potential need to go retrograde and the complexity of that retrograde conduit. If it is unlikely that one needs to go retrograde and we're really just using um, the second axis point for contralateral angiography, then a six French radial um, sheath and um, guide from the arm is, is just fine. If it is a simple retrograde where there's not a lot of hostile um, uh, preliminary work to be done, for example, calcification of the proximal LED, avoiding us getting into a septal, if we think we can access a retrograde quite simply, then I think a radial approach is still possible. In higher complexity scores, um, we tend to be, uh, for JCTOs, a three, four, five, are very much committed to a bifemoral approach at this stage. Great. So he's got the crossbar so lined up, lined up now. So, so Bill, you want to tell us a little bit about your thinking process about using the crossbar? It's instant, right? So that's the main yeah. reason. 
Um, That's the main reason. So hopefully it's instant. So I could have gone true to true is higher. So this is my first approach. And the key with this for everybody in the audience is when I do these cases and when you do these cases, what you shouldn't be thinking is what am I going to do and what's going to work? What you need to be prepared for is what am I going to do if it doesn't work? So when I'm trying to set this case, I'd like to do cross plus true to true. That doesn't mean it will work. If it doesn't, my next strategy would be to go to a microcatheter and wire escalation strategies. If I got submintimal on that distal vessel, I would probably just do submintimal plaque modification or inversion of SCAR, as the, the data that we've been developing would show that for a single branch, that's the safest, most efficacious way to get a remass, and then we would move on to the right. But the key here is I'm not going in saying the cross boss is going to work. Actually, in my head, I'm thinking, what am I going to do if cross boss doesn't work? Bill, you want to show us, so the, you, the spinning speed is obviously very key, and you're seeing how he has the torque here close to the, to the two E, so if the crossbow jumps, which often it does, the crossbow doesn't go very far, because the mechanism of, of perforation or complications with this is if it goes in a branch, you don't realize it keep on spinning, and that can cause the perforation. So as you've seen, which you want like, to stop it. Yep, which is why stents are usually a better place to learn it. And of yeah. course, the one challenge that the boss can have is sometimes it doesn't, there we go, it doesn't like the cap. So we'll see. The other is in stents, especially on an angle like this, is it has the potential to get caught on this, the metal. So I'm going to try about five more seconds here. And, and Bill, what the wire do you have in there? What's your, what? Just a regular workhorse? What's your guide wire yeah, into the... Run through. Okay. Great. So I, I guess... Try bring that out, see if it'll get it off the stent struts. But it's not work. I'll try it briefly. That way, and then we'll go to a pilot to hunter next. And the, okay. so the other challenge there... there. So, so, Bill, the other challenge is, are you concerned about that branch on the top? It looks like it has a little lesion, that little uh, branch of the marginal going on top, or, or not, not really putting a wire there, or...? I mean, you could. I mean, these are, it's, I mean I, it's always interesting is you take a panel and everybody has their own opinion, and the reason there's an opinion is because it's really not right and wrong. It's your own personal comfort level with managing different things. Um, so I wouldn't fault somebody for putting a wire up there. I just chose not to. I'm going to jail it with a stent anyway if I cross this. Unless I decide not to put more stent in, I could just do some form of atherectomy and ballooning and try to avoid re-stenting. Um, that will depend on some of the techniques what we do. So a little bit of this will play out as that branch will depend on how these go. But I certainly would not fault an operator for wanting to protect it. Great. And then Bill, are you going to use the wire through the cross post? Makes it a little extra supportive? Or? Yeah, I'm going to initially try it since I'm already there and save me a step. If it doesn't work or I can't get the cross bus to go after the wire goes somewhere, then, oh, there you go. Uh, maybe. Okay. Let's see if I get the boss to fall. So I guess for the audience, so the cross bus is a very stiff cut. Therefore, pushing a wire through there it provides you really a lot of, um, uh, you know, can uh, uh, make the penetration power very high. So my boss is actually hurting me, not helping me. So I'm going to take it out because it's not helping. Great. One more time. And, and then the, as you can see, um, you know, Bill is moving very quickly through the options. He's going to spend like 20 minutes there spinning the crossbows. He tried for a minute, didn't work. He moved to the next approach. And that's all the hallmark, I think, of the things you're doing in CTO right now. There we go. Looks Close nice. Do you guys see it? Just jump forward. So that's good. We'll see if it goes out at the end. And then, Bill, you have heparin, the basics are just the usual heparin and... Yeah, heparin, ACTs. So, so, nice. so I think there are two... Uh, I think there are two important discussion points. The first thing is that if you notice, in terms of the uh, instant restenosis, going with the cross boss, cross boss moves very slowly intra plaque. Semitimo moves extremely quickly. And the other thing I'd like to ask the panel is, have you had a cross boss exit through a, uh, through the uh, stent strut? So we all, th we all, most of us think that the cross boss is quite safe, staying inside the stent. But have you guys had cross boss? gone outside the stent strut, uh, strut into a seven yeah. space, because yeah. I have seen that. Yeah, M most of these stents by nature that have restenosis are number one reason is under-deployed stents. So, e so Bill, so it's, Bill it's Stefan, so I, you, while you were, um, while you were uh, pushing your, your pilot to 100, 
Um, I knew where I knew why you thought you were you 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 were not into the uh, the the main vessel is by the behavior of the proximal part of your wire, not the tip. When it started to do those big sort of loop or or width, uh, you felt it was not tracking the vessel. Is that right? Yeah. No. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to start. He's going to start. He's going to start. And Bill, is there a little dampening there on the guide? Maybe it's just uh, trying to push the force extra there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, dual Austin system models. Sure. So he should tolerate it pretty well. I'm not including the left main. It's actually just a circle. So I'm going to take a quick picture here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think I'm pretty low, so I'm going to just show some intimal black modification because I think that's safer and easier. People can tell me it's awful. Or they can tell me Bill, do you, think it's a, do you think it's a branch or a little tattoo that you see uh, lower to the tip of your boss? I think the pilot's going the wrong way, so I'm going to stop trying to play with wires because the odds of, of with a wire and finding the way back to the proper thing in a vessel this small is almost zero. So I'm worried about getting a perforation with the guide wire, which is why I'm going to go in and, and effectively start this, which will renaming some minimal mm -hmm. pipe modifications. Bill, are you going to try to maybe uh, re-enter with a stingray there, or it's too small for a stingray? That looks good. No, you got he it. Did it. Hmm? He did it. Yep. He just re-entered. So let's get the down. It's not a great exchange catheter, but we'll take that out. Run through, please. And then, okay, so, the, I guess so the lesson... What we're going to do here is we're going to put a workhorse wire in. We're going to trap out the boss. I'm going to... Laser the stent, just like our peripheral colleagues, so that we don't just swish tissue, and then later when the tissue gets the water back in it, it comes back. So what I want to do is I'm going to laze the tissue out, I'm going to balloon this whole thing, and I probably won't re-stent. We certainly get itis to look at the stent in deployment. You know, Nick brought that up, he introduced to see if that was one of the issues. Um, so, in the travel, please. Bill. So what we'll probably do here is laze, balloon, and then itis, and see how we're looking. Bill, um, yeah. what was your uh, wire you used to, to, to do your knuckle? Was that an XT or a pilot? XT. I like the XT. It's easier to make a loop. It tends to shrink and jump forward easier than the pilot. And if you notice, the loop usually is not three centimeters from the tip. So if you do it with a pilot, it ends up being on the non radio pink portion, so it's harder to see. So I tend to use XTs as my, my wire to do this with. So, so Bill, it's really, it, in a lot of ways, it's cut down my retrograde procedures or really stupid retrograde procedures, like this case, where I can try to go down and do the epicardial collateral from the disc group into it, 18. But I don't want to do that anymore because we know that retrograde is the highest risk procedure we do. It increases the MACE rate three to four times in an antigrade case. And so I'm trying to help make the patient feel better. I'm not trying to make a pretty picture, and so I can decrease the risk, and I know from open CTO and some of the data we were developing here in the U, that in a single vessel or even a couple vessels, this type of event actually will make the patient feel better, which is the, potentially the goal of the procedure. So my retrograde has gone down because I'm trying to be smarter about when I take those risks and how important a pretty picture is versus an open vessel. So what, what you just saw, Dr. Lombardi, what he did is he did the trapping, right? So he used the trapper balloon. As you know, we now have a balloon available specifically for trapping. It's called the trapper balloon uh, from Boston. And the, it, ha it has actually a little plastic piece, so it's, it can work on 90-centimeter guides often used in CTO. Bill, is that the 90 or 100 that you have over there? This is a 90 because I was thinking about going retrograde for the right, sure. so I wanted to be prepared sure. for it. So you can trap the wire, so then you can exchange your microcatheter or the cross post in this particular case without losing your wire position very securely. And if you look at the pressure, the pressure became flat after you put the trapping balloon in there, and then once you release, the pressure came up again. And we do this you know, quite a bit. The issue is afterwards, you want to back bleed the two so you don't get air embolism when you get the equipment back down there. Yeah. I was just say that, Stefan, I don't know if you want to talk about the trap liner, but 
know, radial and six French guides with the trap liner has really innovated a lot of the radial stuff because now you've opened up all your options because the trap liner is so great to work with for doing anti-grade reentry, as well as it prevents hematoma formation by blocking inflow. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that while I'm... Yeah, it's a great, it's a great device. I'm, just to let that so I've got a .9 laser. We're going to laze the ISR out. All I'm planning to laze is the stent segment. And if you want to go ahead and talk, that'd be great stuff on well, uh, that's uh, yeah, it's a great, great introduction to the device. The trap liner is, is really helpful for a, for a situation where uh, you think you can get away with a smaller gear, and you'd like in a and with the trap liner in six French, you can actually trap uh, whatever device uh, that's available for CTO uh, PCI nowadays. It's obviously uh, it, it, it increased a bit you know, the cost of the procedure, but when you compare to a trapper or any other thing, it's pretty uh, marginal. Uh, right now, they price it about a, a little premium compared to a guy liner, so which is very, uh, very manageable for a cat lab cost perspective. So I think it's, uh, it's very useful. But, uh, you know, uh, you, um, you're, you, you, it strikes me how this, the way you opened up that vessel is a bit, is a bit going like 180 degrees to what we've been uh, saying over time. You know, the data on STAR has been quite deceiving uh, in the published data uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, we've, we've published also a, a paper in your intervention this year showing old dissection reentry versus newer one with, uh, with uh, reverse cart or, or, or ADR with crossbar stingray showing that it's better than the old star and the way, the way you executed it well, but in terms of long-term outcomes, if that's really what you care about, uh, 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 Bill, what do you think about that technique? And do you have any other uh, data to support that? Yeah, so it's actually it's one of those, like many things in CTOs, what old is new. So when you go back and you look at the original star data, the star data that did bad was when you stented the patient. If you just ballooned it, they actually did what's called deferred stenting. They tended to do significantly better. So we went back and looked through 30, 33 basically failures where we had done something similar to this where we had failed retrograde, we failed the stingray, we failed with everything, and we either did a, a star mm -hmm. or we just ballooned distal to the proximal cap. Um, and in that situation, what we found was of the 33 we'd done, we got 33 to come back. The 33 that came back, half of them we wired with a workhorse wire and stented, and the other half we only had one failure getting put back together. So these are, were our technical failures that we essentially only had, ended up with one patient that didn't get fixed. What was interesting, if you looked at the post angiogram of the, actually you did this data, I should make you present. <laughs> so the post angiogram from the original procedure, they had two branches on average distally. When we brought them back, they actually had 3.3 branches and better flow. So what we found is start to be very effective when you're failing. It's not a primary strategy, but it's a strategy to reduce risk or in a single branch. And what you'll find is if you defer stenting, that you have the potential to get more branches and better outcomes. So I think, again, star had potential to be better. The issue is they were too beholden to stenting. Right now. So by not stenting, I think in deferring stenting, you actually get some pretty interesting Results and then there's your prophecy. Mm -hmm. Look at that stent. I can't even get even after the laser. I can't get the items uh, to go. Down. It's under two millimeters. So that stent is in a looks like a three O vessel. Can somebody there who knows how to read ibis interpret it for me? <laughs> So, so, Bill, actually, I'm very yeah, impressed you yeah. use the IBUS. Actually, I think it's the first time I see you, but... Uh, <laughs> I actually will tell you, it must be good. It must be coming to the U. I actually do use it a bit more now. Um, I have an interesting IBUS from last week where we, we went retrograde through uh, basically aortic valve leaflets that were across the ostium by a jail core valve. And after both going through them retrograde, we IBUS. It was interesting to look at the leaflets under IBUS. <laughs> You basically just see this chunk of calcium around the catheter. Can I have a Perfect. tool for But I think so for people looking at this, I think what you were seeing is the stent before, previous to that distal part was bigger, about 3 millimeters diameter. 
then at the point where you couldn't advance it anymore, then it was the, the lumen was like two. So there was clearly stent under expansion, which is the most common mechanism for stent failure uh, after in new intima hyperplasia. So this is not the case of new intima. This is a case of initial deployment, as you were saying before, that the stent wasn't deployed, maybe fully expanded to start with, and that's why it may potentially closed up. And that has implications. Before you do anything else here, you would make sure you dilate this, because you put another stent and you don't dilate this enough, then that's going to be a problem. Um, what Absorb showed is not that Absorb's a bad stent, it's that the operators were bad at putting the stent in. And the lesson from that is, we all ought to take home is, we need to be better as stenters, which goes back to the prophetic Dr. Lembo, who, you know, is always one step ahead of us, about doing a good job of stenting. I may not always get it perfect or right, but we're trying a lot harder. The, the Do you like to use these 2040s, 2540s after doing this? Just sort of old school angioplasty technique, do a long inflation of 36. So, Bill, the fact that you lazed could help with the expansion, too. You didn't use any contrast, though, right? When you were lazed, you didn't know that it was underexpanded. I didn't laze on contrast. And I, I was worried, the discussion about doing that in a live case, I mean, I've already sort of off label with some of my laser loose, and obviously I have some conflicts with it. So, I would normally, I would have lazed on contrast, though it's off label. Because um, you do, the cavitation does, and we've got data here with you, our uh, brachytherapy expert, Dr. Don, who does a lot of this, can show you that if you lay on contrast, you'll get better stent expansion than if you don't. So that is a very valid point. I, I'm, I'm always hesitant to, in a course to sort of how far do we want to go with things. So I appreciate you bringing that up on us. No, no, but I think you're right that it's not something you do every day, and you don't do this if you don't have a stand inside. So you don't put contrast and laser if you don't have a stand because you can cause dissections, bad things can happen. But if you have a stand that's underexpanded, then having the contrast, very little puffs while you're lasing can help expand those um, uh, cavitation effect and help the stand expand a little better. So, Bill, Bill uh, Stefan, so if I, if I, uh, if I want to resume uh, your, your thought process is that nowadays with a small target like this, where, you know, uh, aiming at doing an ADR, bringing a stingray, uh, shutting down the, the vessel, not having uh, good visualization is not worth uh, the, the investment, and you should rather maybe just open up the vessel the way you did it, but not stenting. That's, the, that's, your, that's, that's what you think is where we're trending uh, towards, right? At least that's where I'm moving to. You know, what I saw from open CTO stuff on is that I was hurting people, taking too many retrograde risks more than anything. Um, and, you know, the issue with Stingray is it's a good big visible target, great, the small of us like this it can be done, but this tends to be much simpler, and I think from an educational standpoint, easier to teach. Absolutely. A boatload of data to develop on. Do we stand? Do we not stand? Who should we stand? Who should we not stand? You know, I wish I had drug loading balloons. Because I could do, I would think doing DEB in this and maybe never stenting might actually be best uh, as an option. So I've got a 3 0 balloon always going to go through to open up the stent up there. And so I'm going in with the sort of I don't want to stent this vessel. You're going to go 16. And Bill, you haven't um, injected yet, right? You just went for dissections or. Um, you, haven't, you haven't done an injection yet. You're just waiting to no, make sure you... I want to make sure I have good outflow. I want to get everything yeah. treated. You know, the issue is I may only have flow into this branch to the right. So I was going back and looking at my original setup shot. So one of the things may be is if I need to, if I don't like the outflow, is I actually will come in and we'll try to re or redirect into a different branch and do it again and try to get two branches. And that's actually, in, in a lot of these things that have both branches, one of the things you do is you blow them, you, you, basically start both branches and bloom and let them come back. Um, yeah. One of the other things that I thought was interesting, Stefan, and uh, TCT, the abstraction come up, we're trying to get the paper accepted, nobody will actually review it. But in open CTO, there were 136 core lab adjudicated failures. So these are 11 experienced centers who are pretty good at CTOs, pretty good at retrogrades, and in their core lab adjudicated failures, we looked at patients who got a 2-0 or bigger balloon blown up proximal or distal to the proximal cap. So we may never have got outflow, we may never have got across, but in a failure, they took a 2-0 or bigger balloon and blew it up within the CTO segment. 
What was interesting, and that was about half of the failures actually had that happen. What was interesting is Seattle answered a questionnaire follow-up at six months and one year showed a statistically significant improvement in quality of life of those patients who got a balloon versus those who did not, which again goes back to some of this issue of potentially dissecting the occlusion segments may allow hydraulic pressure of, of systemic pressures to sort of open the vessel and get flow into the distal stream. We don't know, I got huge data. But this is real data, core lab adjudicated failures, blowing up a balloon past the proximal cap, and you had a systematic, a, a statistically significant, on a validated metric, improvement in quality of life. So the take home I have for that, everybody in the audience is, if your wires in the architecture past the proximal cap, and you're gonna fail, blow up a big balloon in that space and change the architecture. I don't know what other people's thoughts are on that, but I thought that was interesting data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's also the, the investment idea. Even if you're going to go back, having this plane, as you say, sometimes you're going to be fine. So, that looks awesome, Bill. That looks great. Yeah, I got a little pinch in that upper branch, but as we know by FFR stuff, that usually is treating the, you know, treating the angio, not the patient. Well, let's take this wire out and kind of some nitro. Uh, Maybe Bill, just ask the panel. Maybe you can ask. Uh, yeah. Nick, uh, Bill, it's Nick here. Um, you know, speaking of off label uh, things, since. We do that from time to time. I think you could get a drug. I think you could get a drug eluding balloon in there, and in this case, I would be very tempted to do that. You know, getting a four O D E B would make me a little nervous just because of the size of the distal vessel. I agree with you. I think on ultrasound it was big enough. Yeah, you could be right, Nick. We certainly do that. We've done a, a bunch of cases. Actually, we've done drug eluding balloon and brachytherapy at the same time. Yeah. Um, what I'm really looking forward to is getting the below knee balloons approved, so we'll have something a little more size appropriate. Yeah, that's been, that's been my, argument, yeah, that's been my approach, particularly in restenotic vein grafts, is to brachy and uh, do uh, DEB. Great. And then maybe, maybe we can check more issues. You have this now bifurcation, essentially, that the small brands. Would you do anything in the bifurcation or would you just leave it alone? It looks like have good flow on both vessels. I don't know any thoughts on that part. That, that bifurcation looks a little bit looks a little bit disrupted. That vessel was not occluded to begin with, and probably is feeding viral tissue. So, I mean, if, if you went all the way to save that small, relatively small branch, I'd rather probably protect that branch and and, and do some type of bifurcation strategy. Sure. So, Bill, are you planning to do anything to that uh, branch, or just leave it and go to the right and uh, see how it heals? Leave it, go to the right. I'd come back okay. and deal with it later. I think we tend, in my opinion, is we tend to overstent because that's what we're trained to do. Um, and a lot of times, the, what we've learned is it's not about a, not, not about pretty pictures. Of course, I can't get the cirque. Yeah, no, I, think I agree, especially here, another reason not to stand, actually, because you have some dissection, presumably, at the side of the crossbars, then you have the little knuckling. So, you know, if you stand one, you may have to do some complex to stand techniques. It might be much more complicated than you want to. So there's nothing wrong leaving it there. You have Timothy flow in both branches and see how it goes. Again, I don't think it, I mean, I appreciate Marisa's comments, but I don't think it looks all that bad. And, you know, the FFR data shows, you know, 90% stenosis by a jailed stent, actually, a lot, most of the time, isn't actually dynamically significant because it's not just the stenosis, it's the length of the stenosis. So I appreciate the comments. You may be absolutely right. Same with Nick and the diagonal. But at this point, I'm going to sort of say I've got a nice result. Um, we can come back. Uh, potentially, like I said, I like to sometimes bring these stars back to relook at them and see how they healed up. I think this one looks reasonably good, though not perfect. And I'm going to go now so spend the last Bill, an hour. You, Bill, what, you want to tell us a little bit what's your contrast radiation? Uh, it looks like well, everything's very smooth. 0.35 but. gray. Um, so we're in a Phillips clarity room right now working on 10 and a half inch. So I'm at 0.3 gray. How much contrast phase? That's amazing. So it looks like, so you came and used, looks like very little radiation, very little contrast in general. So that's perfectly, perfect going to the other one. If you had used 300 of contrast and 5 gray, obviously, you might think again uh, twice about going for the, for the yeah, right as well. Bill, Bill Farouk here. I just think a super important observation here is that uh, many people wouldn't have even attempted the uh, circumflex TO because they would have said this is a super small target vessel. 
and it's not worth doing. That might have been the initial reflex, and it just really demonstrates how underfilled and how negatively remodeled these are. And you barely have to give any vasodilators, and this thing, you know, really just expanded dramatically. So I think an ischemic study and symptoms are really important to dominate the thinking here and not only rely on what might be a very underfilled collateral. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the data on that's pretty clear. You know, you know Freddie Glossy showed this a long time ago. They're going to grow 30%, so if it's too old before we start, it's going to be a 300. Um, and so I think, again, I try to look at the territory and length, not the size of the vessel. Um, same thing, look at that APGOL ID. That one said it's too small to stand. And again, this is a care variability issue that our profession sort of has to start evaluating how we want to deal with it. Perfect. And actually, if I look, I think you're absolutely right. And it may, grow, it may grow even more if you leave it a few months to give some more flow and grow up as well. Um, so I think it, went, it was done perfectly and very smooth. Now, coming on the basics again, so Bill is coming with an AL guide. Um, you know, many people, we will proctor, they have a hard time using an AL for the right coronary. Just getting into the people, people's thoughts uh, on how often you use, like a complex case like this, how often you use a, an amplitude left for the right system or not. I know, Minha, I know you, you're a big fan of that, or most people, but... Yeah, so, I mean, again, I think the issue is, is you want to set up to win. Yeah. Um, and, and it's sort of like talking about radial and femoral. It doesn't matter if you use radial or femoral. The guide support, different things, and what you're coming with, almost all of the challenges can be solved. The key is, in CTOs, it's about push. And as long as you get maximal push, you can get a great outcome. And if you can do that with a JR4 guide, great, but if you're struggling, you have to be able to figure out another solution to improve guide support, whether that's an anchor balloon, whether that's a guide extension, or whether that's a different guide, or a larger guide. I think any of those are options to be successful. And I think at times, people spend way too much time discussing nuances that in the grand scheme of things are less important than the corner needs to be fixed. If you're struggling, you have to understand is, what am I struggling with? Am I struggling with guide support? Am I struggling with ambiguity? Am I struggling with calcium, when I'm struggling with an impenetrable cap, I'm struggling with ambiguity retrograde. I mean, there's a series of intra-procedural algorithms. Actually, my fellow last year, Robert Ryan and I worked with Eric Rantham and others, all of you on the panel included, of really trying to proceduralize and develop algorithms during the procedure. And so when the cross boss didn't work, we used a pilot. When the boss didn't come out in the true lumen, we had you know, three options. I can go retrograde, I can do stingray, or I can do star. That had been a big, giant, bifurcating OM with a lovely collateral. Oh, Doesn't matter. Side holes. Um, you know, big, giant, bifurcating OM with a great collateral, I probably would have got retrograde. If it had a giant landing zone before the bifurcation, then I would have thought about doing the stingray. Um, if neither of those were available, I might have starred both branches to try and get a win. The, the key here is too many people want to sort of show I can do this or I can do that or this is the right technique. None of the techniques are right and wrong. So they're options. And I, I think it's really important for the educators to start accepting, you know, this is really still a very creative space. And what we need to do is be thoughtful about what we're doing is, is it reproducible? Um, is it safe? And is it really helping the patient? Um, you know, I can share lots of great technical success cases where the patient had a huge complication because I did, you know, a stupid procedure. So I showed off how great I was, but I didn't get the patient what he needed. And that's really why the symmetrical plaque modification, I'm really good at retrograde, I'm really good at stingray, I'm pretty good at wiring stuff, but I needed to find something to take the last 10 or 12 percent of patients that I was struggling with and help them. And the other was to be very objective about the fact that retrograde is dangerous. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at some of the other registries, the 40, 50, 60 percent of their procedures are retrogrades. I mean, it's, it's really cool, and I understand why retrogrades are awesome. Clearly, I was, you know, one of the first guys doing it in the U.S., and I promoted it a bunch, and I still think it's a great procedure. But you change the risk profile when you do that. And I think we have to be honest about that. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think several registries and other studies, and I think Open is going to show that as well. Retrograde does have increased risk. If you go on the grade, it's faster, safer. There's no question this is the, the way to go. Um, but I think the, the challenge here is, to, to your point, 
that uh, it's great to have options, but for many people who don't do the high, the high volume and the complexity that you do or other operators in the panel do, it can be harder as well to do. And that's the thing, having seen these can help them do this if they have a similar situation in their lab. Stefan wants to say something. Bill, Bill, regarding the issue you're having with the guide, AL, and everything, we've, you know, it, it, radial operators, we've struck, we struggle a lot with, with getting the guys. And one, one trick I've learned over time is to get the back end of your wire uh, the O35 and get the nose down and then th re repeat the same maneuver and sometimes it avoids flipping fl flip him, flipping over the osseum and getting around you know the same kind of procedure and and it, it, it works really well in those situations sometimes when you can't get the nose down enough but you can deflect the nose and get into where you want to get, get the guide in sometimes it works just the yeah, I mean, just before Lembo told me to get narrow one guide I figured I'd ask for it ahead of time because I remember that's one of the next favorite guys. He's but very quiet on this <laughs> but maybe a good JR here would do the job. If you're telling that it's a short CTO and you're not, and you you always have the option of getting a guideliner to improve your support, especially if you're in French, right? Yep. So I, I agree. I mean, this is the, the the key thing that I want people to see is I'm not trying to make a guide work. I'm just going to work, the, and it's the same thing with the procedures. I'm not trying to make anything work. I'm accepting what doesn't work and move on to the next solution because that's the key. So Bill, it's been here. So the other thing I found helpful in terms of uh, the AL guide is I do use a lot of AL guides for the right, and I usually engage the right first, just because once you engage the left, then it's in the way of the AL, and it's always hooking, as you've shown multiple times here. It's always hooking on your left, and it'll take out your left, and it's difficult to engage the, the AL guide. So usually I do the AL first, then engage the left. And also a simple trick, Min, is uh, you, you keep a wire in your donor artery, so therefore you stop disengaging your left guide or your donor guide all the time. So that's one way we do because of the manipulation and the radial sometimes happen. Uh, the, you disengage your, 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 your other guide. So you just left a wire in your donor artery, and then you avoid the disengagement and having to reposition your, what, your, your guide. And then, Bill, are there case times we just go JR and just put the guide liner if it doesn't get support, if it gets uh, tough? But I think the other message here is, so this, you can see the, other, the two seeds, these are 45 centimeter long seeds that uh, are in the groin. Another hallmark of, you know, the good CTO technique, you have longer guides, less impact of electrotruosity, more support, you can manipulate your guides easier. So again, taking the time to put those long seeds in makes things much easier. You see how hard it was to engage this. I can tell you it would, it would be much high, harder having not have these long guides or even going from uh, radial, for example. Well, I think the, the other thing is, you know, it's the comment of, you, you're not trying to do a CTO, you're not trying to rebass. This guy was sent to bypass surgery, right? And I'm pretty sure he was sent to bypass surgery because they wanted the LAU to serve in the right treatment. So if that's what he would have got at surgery and I want to have a comparator therapy, then I have to do the same thing. But you, I've never heard a surgeon open up somebody's chest and go, ah, I think I'll just try and do a bypass, we'll see what happens. You know, they go there to do it, and it's the same thing here is, Again, yeah, if you're going to do it, try to do it in the best way uh, possible. Uh, at least that you have the ability to. And if you don't have the ability, then you can have somebody else do it. It's okay. And that's, I, don't know, I mean, for Mark and I, it's a great relationship. Mark obviously is one of the best corner interventionists. He developed Rotoblader. He's taught everybody around the world. But it's a nice relationship. You know, we got, you saw that complicated mitral valve. I mean, it's really nice to have somebody an expert at that. And I focus on this, and I don't do my jobs, and that's okay. I mean, it's, I don't know if you want to comment on the evolution of the profession, that way, Mark, but no, I think that's uh, for the crew here. I think working with Bill has been uh, really unique in so much of what, you know, has been the traditional PCI training has really been turned upside down. I, I think earlier some of the comments that were made about, you know, aiming for some of that little space and accepting that. Um, and a bunch of other uh, techniques have really been uh, tremendous to, uh, to watch evolve. Uh, in terms of the subspecialization of the space, um, it's really uh, complicated. Uh, you know, as young people get trained and, uh, you know, be trying to decide uh, where they, what they want to do and what they're going to commit to, and, and, and then all the anxiety around um, those choices, um, you know, in terms of getting a job, to be passionate for, you know, a career in those particular areas. So it's really been, um, it's interesting for Bill and I as we, you know, trying to work with folks like Kate and our other fellows, really to uh, give them some level of guidance, but 
you know, create boundaries or, or somewhat borders so they can make decisions that are comfortable for them and, and get on a track that they're very passionate about. Uh, not a simple task, frankly. Because right now, I, I came, I could say this is like a, like a buffet of opportunity. You just don't know what you want to take off the buffet. You've got, you know, Bill here and seeing all this wonderful stuff. And I know you like structural art. I don't know if you want to comment about some of your challenges with your fellows in the audience. Sure, yeah, I think for Christina, Tam, my co-fellow and I, it's really great to see all of, like, all the subspecialty work that we do here, but it does make it challenging to choose this early in our fellowship, but yeah. and the, we'll figure know, it out. And it's, and it's going to be hard to decide. So, uh, uh, can I, actually, can I follow yeah, a question? Sure. Me? So the question is, do you think you need to decide, or should you be able to do structural and corners and equivalent level? Is that your concept coming in? Or do you think it should be sort of increasingly more specialized? You're asking me a bit. I'm going to ask Kate first. Yeah, the right spot. Yeah. She's smart. I mean, I think when we've been talking right now, we're interested in both, so we'd like to pursue both. But seeing kind of the nuances of what each of you do, it, it doesn't seem plausible to be in that kind of space and really doing structural like so, okay, so Bill, I see you are, uh, this is great points. I see Bill, you are working already. So maybe we can touch the, on the panel. So, so Nick, Nick Burke, so what, what do you think? It's a, describe the CTO for us. I of the audience are not experienced looking at the, at the CTO. Maybe give us a little uh, touch of what you think and what would you do? Well, you know, by the hybrid algorithm, it's, it has a non-ambiguous proximal cap, distal cap. There's a good distal vessel and it's not terribly long. So uh, your first choice generally in this case is a wire escalation strategy. Um, generally, you'll take a depending upon the tortuosity of the vessel, you take a workhorse wire in a microcatheter of your choice. Uh, to that point, it doesn't look like you're going to need anything terribly specialized to get through there. Um, you know, a turnpike LP or something of that nature. And then most of us start with a uh, hydrophilic, very soft tip, uh, tapered wire, such as a, a Fielder um, XTA. Uh, particularly, if that fails, um, knowing the root of the artery, something uh, with a bit more oomph, uh, a Pro 12, um, or a uh, Pilot 200, if you're uh, less convinced about the, the course of the artery. If it goes offline, um, it depends upon kind of how it's doing it. If it's just going straight and following the vessel, you can use that uh, to get your microcatheter down there to set up for Stingray. Uh, and if, if not, if you're having trouble right off the bat and it's just uh, bunching up, uh, I would try a cross bus. Perfect. Perfect. And maybe, uh, Bill, you can tell us, so what you're using, a Coursera thing, and what, what was the no, wire? A, uh, I use Turnpike Spire. Turnpike, okay. And if you can use a Coursera, I think, don't get too confused. There's actually too many catheters in the market. You're going to have 47 different opinions. For the people in the audience, pick the same family because they turn the same way. So either be a Turnpike guy or a Corsair guy, or a woman, whichever, you know, is the thing. Um, I like the spiral atom rate because I like the fact that it locks in better and the tip is slightly more resistant to calcium. Um, I don't like the LP integrate because the distal shaft is 2.2 millimeters, so you actually lose penetration power of your guide wires. Um, in regards to which wires, there's polymer jacket and stiff wires, that would be the pilot and the gladius. There's penetration wires that would be the Compenza Pro 12, the Hornet 14, and the Estado uh, 20. Like, again, which of those you want to use or how you want to estimate it, that's up to you. But the, the key is you want to use wires with very different properties. I don't actually use XT or XTA um, because there have been multiple studies now showing that those wires are actually the lowest likely to cross the CTO. And so I don't like to waste time with things that don't work when I have other solutions. So I try to pilot briefly and just for Predator for fun, I try to try to Gladius, which also doesn't look like it's going. My like microcatheter is too far from the tip. So, so Gladius for the people who don't use it it's routinely, it's actually a 014, but it's more of a peripheral wire, it's called. But it's a polymer jacketed wire with composite core, so it has good torquing and uh, it's, uh, it's like a pilot to harness sense and polymer jacketed, but with the new technology like the Gaia wires. It actually is stiffer. It, they, they actually tell you a lot. It actually is stiffer than the. Um, so, so Bill, Bill, how would you how would you qualify that cap? It's to me, it's an interesting cap. It's a blunt cap that's got a branch as usual, and also, but it's not that ambiguous in the course because the the CTO is not that long. So, therefore, that's the reason why you probably even if it's a blunt cap, you feel it's not in an ambiguous cap. Would that, 
Would that be yeah. okay? No, I think you're both strong. I, I absolutely agree with it. I think, you know, ambiguity is a bit unethical holder. It's sort of like interventional collaterals. Um, I think, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about it. The reality is it all depends on your comfort level with what you've done and what you do. Um, so to me, this is not an ambiguous cap. But just like every case, if I can't penetrate it, then I've got to come up with another mm -hmm. solution. And that's the case we talked about earlier. I'm just going to work through my wires. That doesn't work. And I'm going to stop and think about what my options are to manage it. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those, too. You just don't want to forget your basic PCI principles, knowing that it uh, – did you, did you take an RAO projection of this, Bill? I will in a second. Yeah, you, be, before you start, Bill's obviously an expert. But this is where you, you run into problems and in not, not knowing where you are in two views. So you want to use your RA view to, to line up the vessel. And you could also see his, his guide is not very supportive in that position. It's kind of sideways. So he wants to clock that in there so it's against the opposite wall and it'll get more power to do that. But there's a lot of bridging collaterals. And this, bit of odd this, this could be a minefield for, for a beginner. So, Bill, you're dancing, so it's moving well with the vessel, but it's unclear if it's in the lumen or it's in subminimal space at this point, I guess. Yeah, the, the, uh, I think the dance is not, I mean, it's, uh, what do you think, Bill? Good teaching point. So, and I guess the subintimal part, I think what, what Bill is referring to is essentially knuckling and going subintimally from this point because the knuckle is more likely to follow the path of the vessel versus exit to it safer in a way. But that, of course, presupposes that you're comfortable with the reentry maneuvers and using the stingray and getting back in. And so if you you're not very comfortable with that, that obviously increases the threshold for using these techniques. But if you are, then that's a great way to resolve this problem where the wire is not penetrating or the wire is going places that it doesn't, you know, clear that this is the right vessel course. And this will take a little bit of a political incorrect statement on you, which is if you're doing CTOs and you're not comfortable doing the reentry techniques, then refer them or go learn how to do them. It'd be like saying, you know, I'm going to do tabber, but I don't know how to do valvioplasty, and I don't know how to put a valve in. I mean, it's, at some point we have to accept, at this point, the, many of these techniques are very well established, very well known, and we really need to get better. Give me that one I'm back. Okay, I'm going to take one more shot at this, and then I'm going to get frustrated and do something different. So, so, Bill, so this is still the pilot? You got the pilot back, or which one? I'm going the pilot, and the catheter okay. slipped back up. I didn't get the catheter to the Great. So the options you said are you can go retrograde or you can go this extra re-entry with making a loop. Uh, maybe that's the panel. Any, any preferences from the, on the, from is, the panel? Bill, is there any opportunity, any opportunity to base there? That's the thing. Is I, I mean, it'd be tough to base. There's not a lot of disease. It's a pretty short, short segment. So it would be a potential very tough base. And with as good as the collaterals looked, I sort of feel like... Farouk, would you like to explain a little bit for the audience a little bit about the base? Or, or me, so because people are not sure they know what the base means. Do you like yeah, to just right. so, just, uh, so that basically is trying to move the proximal cap and really change the base of operations to create an, a known intentional dissection with balloon 
assisted subintimal entry. So by taking a short balloon oversized uh, to create a dissection right in front of the actual proximal cap, then a slippery wire can get into that dissection and knuckle safely into the architecture around the proximal cap and one can go. Um, that's sometimes a way to resolve this very difficult um, entry point here, which looks like it's going to take um, a wire and get into the architecture quickly, but it's clearly finding channels that are not um, through, through, the, through the actual arc main vessel. Great. And, and based on for balloon assisted subintimal entry, which again creates a dissection to use it as a pathway. And actually, Min has a, a, published a nice paper on this describing the technique as well as the mo uh, uh, stick and, um, and uh, the, the wall and, and go back. Yeah, Tony D. Martini actually developed it when he was proctoring. And the reason being scratch and go is too hard to teach people to get into the vessel architecture. We're using a balloon to intentionally dissect the coronary was a lot simpler and safer to teach people. And it's a, you know, it's a really nice technique both for impenetrable caps and for ambiguity uh, in the proximal cap because you just get yourself in the subliminal space. In case you have to not do re-entry, either integrate or retrograde. And we, there it is. And we had a case so recently. Yep. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, there we go. All right. So, folks, so, so now my course is should I feel better because the knuckle has said I'm in the architecture. Whereas before, I wasn't so sure. I'm going to take this knuckle a little more just to make you feel really good. So, what there you're seeing here is you don't want to push microcatheters over the wire. You don't know where it is. You're sure it's in the right spot. And again, subconsciously, you see Bill automatically went to RAO. It was going to be two projections because sometimes you get fooled in one projection. So automatically, he went from LAO, RAO, confirmed the position. All right. So there is a potential reentry zone on the vertical, though it's tough. Traditionally, we go all the way to the bottom. But I, I'm going to take my shot at doing this in the vertical. So what I want to do now is I want to go in with my cross boss and sort of just boss down a little bit further. And Bill, how do, you, how do you decide how far you're willing to push an ADR strategy? Is it worth going past that distal RV branch? How far do we go, or do we convert to retrograde in this situation? Right, so I, I think this is one of those, if I can do it on the vertical, I'm going to take it because that gets me a big win. If I can't, then I would flip retrograde because, again, that way I'm not going to you know, take out so many acute marginals. And if I then can't get in retrograde, then I would come back and I would then go down to the horizontal right and try to do an entry there. And if that didn't work, then I would start starring everything and doing some interval plaque modification to bring back the fight another day. So, Bill, you're telling, us, you're telling us you care about keeping RV branches. I'm telling you that... Uh, you're willing to take the yes, risk of a retrograde for this. certs and OMs and diagonal epicardial collaterals, those are much higher risk, and that's where you see people causing real harm. So I think, yes, I would take that risk, okay, in this case, as long as I can do it safely. So, Bill, now that this has pretty much established right-to-right -right collaterals and you're dissecting the vessel, what's your, what's your game plan for visualizing your entry point? Okay. I think that's another as you get better at the stuff you really have to learn but, sort of how to do things blindly to keep the contrast used down and also just uh, and actually that's the nice thing about knuckles is knuckles tell you where you are a cross boss doesn't tell you where you are a wire doesn't tell you where you are a micro-pather doesn't but a knuckle will because the size and shape of a knuckle tells you main branch, side branch or out and that's a huge advantage because that's you know, when people get into trouble is you get outside the vessel trap, okay? So he's, he's pretty much done injecting that Amplatz guide till, till I'll, I'll tell you how much I'm done with it. Till the case is over. So that nobody accidentally picks it up. Bill, you said, you, Bill, you said that the behavior of the knuckle tells you where you are. Uh, 
it might be it's it's not time for for a lecture obviously you're working hard but what 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 in few words could tell you you're out few words you're telling you're in a vessel structure and and whatever you know what what makes you confident about the position so So the crossbar is again is slightly bigger than the, the turf mic, so it's not going through the cap, so I've got to dial it. My guide stinks, so now I'm going to switch to a trap liner, um, trap it down, because that'll help you get a little sore. So the key here, as you said, Stefan, is see that loop? It's two to three millimeters, it's following the calcium, it looks just like the proximal right one it looks. If it were in an acute marginal, you wouldn't see any distance, it would compress and the, the two sides would shrink next to each other. And if it wasn't in the coronary, it would be about that big around and look like a giant C. And so the knuckle bite, the change of its character, can help somebody understand where they are. And you know, if you're doing 30, 40, 50 millimeter CTOs, you with a, with a wire is never gonna tell you right or wrong. That's why I don't boss uh, long segments. I boss landing zones. And that's, you know, the goal here is I like this cross boss I think you're right. We've certainly learned over time to use the cross boss uh, more intelligently. It's it's a uh, I would call it a good finisher, a pretty good, a pretty bad starter, and it's uh, and uh, you know you trust your knuckle, you don't trust the bus. Yesterday, so I tend not to scrub with well. So yesterday, Kate did her first PCI without the attending standing next to her at the table, which is very exciting given it's August. I got it. Um, and so that was cool. But one of the things I have to talk about is when you approach a non-CTO, it's different than how you approach a CTO. And that's one of the challenges for people is you really have to accept is this has about as much to do with coronary invention as Tabra does. It's a very different animal, it's different techniques, it's different approaches. And so we really need to sort of, you need to rethink what you're doing. And the, the challenges in non-CTO PCI is everything is based on the wire. And that's, that's great, that's what it's supposed to be. But in CTO, that doesn't translate at all. And what you usually see people who are learning CTO struggle with is they keep wanting to play with wires. Um, and at least my experience has been is that's a recipe to get yourself to fail a lot, or take a really long time in your cases because you're getting dogmatic with your device that really doesn't help. Okay, let's go there to 20. So, but I think so I'm going to inflate my balloon. Maybe a good example here of how this to move quickly, right? You see, he tried the crossbars, 30 seconds didn't work, he switched. The manifold is disconnected. He's got a balloon, guide liner to go down, trap liner. So every, every step you know, is thought of and is not only more, more efficient, but also safer. It gets you down. You don't do things that wouldn't work. If you would have the wire here, the wire was going different places, you have high risk of perforating or causing complications than doing this knuckle that was done. Now the guide liner, is, the trap liner is down. Now you have extra support. You can get your crossbows to go down. So every step you know, becomes second nature and move very quickly. So the position goes faster, the stuff gets better, and it's very safe as well. Now, for more people, you know what I think Bill is trying to do is to re-enter in the in the vertical part of the right, which is hard. Which is harder. So, for most people, when they have a situation, they would just do the cross boss all the way to the distal right, the horizontal part of the right corner, and then try to go uh, and re-enter. The challenge here is you don't want to balloon that vessel because then you may have more hematoma. But if you cannot deliver anything, then that's a problem. That's why he had to the balloon there. But traditionally, if you had this uh, situation. You, you don't want to put in any balloon until after you re-entered and you have now re-entered to the distal lumen. But again, reality can sometimes be different. But the beauty about the trap liner here is that it can trap and it can stop the inflow with the same device, preventing uh, emetoma in the coronary. So that's that's a. I think it's a it's a strong asset to ADR right now. So Bill, so, wh so why did you use the, uh, the six French uh, trap liner instead of just maximizing your uh, support with, uh, yeah, with the... I was kind of worried if I could deliver it because the proximal, take this one out, because the proximal right's on the smallish side then, and um, so I, that's kind of why. It would have been a bigger 
ride, or I'd go further down. I probably would have used the eight. But the nice thing is the six is pretty easy to deliver. Um, the other argument to say use the eight is, is I might go retrograde, so the extension reverse card would be a lot easier. Because now I'm sitting here waiting to do reverse card. If I get this wrong, we'll just flip and go backwards. But we'll see. Is the wire in? Nope. Seven to one. Okay. Whatever 12, Sting A one. So all I do is take a workhorse wire. It doesn't come out. You can feel it's not working right, so that means I'm submittable and I'm following my track very nicely. But as Juan was saying, you know, one of the things everybody sort of talks about, you know, the reason I'm efficient is because I fail these here. I don't try to make a strategy work. I just say, well, that doesn't work, and I know what my next option is. And I think the important thing for the audience is that they really learn from these pieces and courses are, what are my options? Um, you know, I don't, you know, even for some of the non CTO stuff, Mark, you know, you've been using more Corsairs and my Panthers and sort of, I don't know if you want to comment sort of some of the pull throughs of these techniques yeah. and the whole attitude of switching. Yeah, no, I think the, the, the concept of being vulnerable, you know, during a case and not being able to, you know, manage certain issues is, is really improved by having the CTO techniques at your, uh, at your hands. So it's been very, very helpful just to do basic corners and you get dissections or get into challenges to have some of these techniques that are uh, from the CTO uh, users. Great. So, so Bill, the plan is so you have the Miracle 12 to deliver Stingray, and then, and then, are you going to do the uh, blind stick and swap? And uh, what, what is your plan for the entering here, my given it's the vertical? Is, is, is probably a blind stick and swap. So my plan will be is to do a sort of blind stick and swap. I'll stick, and I'll use the pilot to help me figure it out. If the pilot feels good, then I'll take a picture from a retrograde captain. And again, it's, I've got about eight minutes. If this doesn't work in eight minutes. Then I'm going to flip retrograde and do a reverse card. The, the nice thing here is I have no penalty to what I just did because the reverse card is waiting for me to do. And also, if I fail with being able to get in retrograde, then I can discuss you know, whether I want to do some individual plaque modification and come back and fight another day. So the nice thing about all of these is that they dovetail in a nice systematic way to facilitate the next therapy. So, Bill, just to clarify regarding the blind stick and swap for the audience here. Now, if you stick one port and you feel a pop, do you stick the other port and try stick two ports as uh, Manu was published in the manuscript? Or do you, once you have a pop, you're done, you don't go for the other port? I always stick both. Because as many times I think I'm right, I'm wrong. So, I just, I've gotten into that and stick it both. So, again, for the audience, just to clarify. So, in the past, we used to get a stingray balloon down, inflate it. Make sure the balloon looks like a single line because two lines means you have that you're looking at, at it from the front and you want to look at it from the side. And then you would take a picture, see where the vessel is, which side of the balloon, and then try to stick from that side. So it was a lot of contrast, a lot of uh, x ray you had to use. Now, instead of doing that, we just get the, the stingray down, we inflate the balloon, we put the stingray wire on both sides of the balloon, so on both ports. You don't get any penalty for exiting from the Adventitia side. It's just a wire, it won't perforate, it won't give you any pericardial diffusion. And then with the polymer wire, you go on both sides and see which way the wire takes and travels down. And this way, so again, you save contrast, fluoroscopy, and it can be fairly effective. So you so see. I always straw from the stingray balloon now, so I'm just doing a little aspiration here, if you can see. So you have a little hematoma, it looks like. So, so Bill, this is really important for that the audience understand the the, what he's done to maintain and work with the subintimal space to keep that as small as possible a space in the area that he's trying to re-enter. He wasn't worried about it when he was going through the CTO, but it's where he's trying to re-enter because the smaller the subintimal space, the larger the true lumen is distally and the easier it is to get into. I think, uh, Bill, uh, I saw that you didn't... That's good. That's beautiful. That's a bit lucky. Bill. So I'm going to show you. So that's good. I'm going to show it down, hopefully, just so we can see what that looks like. That's going to be caught up. Okay. That's good. It's, I can't actually get a bad view of it. That's hilarious. Yeah, sometimes you can't find a, a good view. And sometimes, yeah, and exactly. <laughs> Usually, this isn't the problem. <laughs> I'm going to say, oh, well. So I'm going to have to explain two lines, two dots. It's maybe because there's only one wing that's, o that's open. Yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> what am I still 
But Bill, uh, Bill, just just a quick question. Uh, I you didn't wonder, you didn't bother about the fact that your miracle was much more distal because it was a straight wire. So that's the reason why you were not worried, and you basically prefer to have a good rail to get your 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 stingray. But but as long as you don't have a knuckle and you have a straight wire, you're fine with that. Exactly. And Bill, do you ever mug up on this so you can see it a little clearer, or you just... It's just, I'm going to help you guys out. I usually wouldn't do this, but... So that's one part, right? And... So you're in between the two markers, it looks like, or... It feels awful, so I'm not excited. So this is where you always want to be sure. A 95% chance that he's in the true architecture, but a slight, slight chance he could be in that RV branch. Well, what, what wire is that? Is that the Stingray? It's the Stingray wire. It's the Stingray wire. So I'm the pilot. So neither port felt great. No, I, if I had to bet, it's inside curve. Yeah, that's great. Sure. All right, I'll show that. I'll show the pilot. Probably farther than I should have gone. I'm sorry, guys. That was a bad thing to do. You can yell at me. That was a mistake. <laughs> we, we, we thought you were going to leave it there. You're patient. <laughs> Your patient maybe need to pee at this point. Uh, if you look at the pressure, and maybe a little nitro could help. I know. Scott, is he doing okay? Actually, that's a controversial topic. Do you give nitro during a CTO, even the pressure goes up a little bit? He's asleep right now, so okay. It always, uh, always makes me nervous, because I'd rather have a high pressure than a low pressure. If yeah. If not something were to happen. I pretend. Yeah. Hypertension is easy to manage for, during CTO PCI. It's the reverse that's a bit, a bit, a bit more annoying. Well, I think the majority are not, not more common, but I think it looks, looks promising. Chickens. Oh, we can't see. Huh. What's it now? So maybe you have flow integrate now. Yeah. It's getting a lot of branches. <laughs> nah, you take branches. Yeah. Okay, so the real way to prove this is going to be come down and switch out with a work horse wire. Which if I do, I'm going to do down just as we start into the horizontal. The reason being is if I screwed up, then I don't wreck the downstream vessel any further and we can go retro. Okay? So we're going to deflate the stinger below. But I think, uh, Bill, an important question for you is how did it feel? So by, oh, not, not only by visualization, if it feels great to you, then I think, then it feels great, then it's in. So, the only so, downside is I wish we'd had it. When there's not calcium, it's easy for a pilot to get you lost. And also, I think I think the, the the one point it took me like years to understand that, but it's when to figure out and geographically if your wire is subintimal, it's not the tip of your wire that you should watch; it's the body of the wire that tells you the answer. The body gets gets large, sinusoidal, doesn't get doesn't feel right, and this is. Occurs behind the tip. That's where you know you're having. If you get any resistance in buckling at the back end. Control. That's it. I agree with you, Stephon. That's a great teaching point for everybody in the audience. Uh, that's really, really critical. Hey, Fro, I was wondering if you might comment on doing this exchange. You know, one of the algorithms that we're really struggling with is ambiguity. Both anagrade and retrograde are usually post cabbage patients. And I know you've been doing some really interesting work with CT overlay. And how have you been finding that as a help to deal with some of the uh, ambiguity issues? Because it's you actually have access to it real time in your lab, if I remember correctly. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I found it to be increasingly helpful, and especially for the specific um, problem that you mentioned, which is this ambiguous proximal cap. And I think we, we focus on the ambiguous proximal cap, but we should also be talking about the ambiguous proximal course of the whole vessel, because even if we penetrate the cap fairly, we can still deviate off target. So we, um, we definitely spend time in our lab in our, with our radiologist uh, colleagues, and we will extract centerline information and calcification and actually do 3D reconstructions. It's been very helpful to really know the course of the vessel before you're starting to stick in 
very um, sharp wires. I had a very similar case yesterday where the stiff wire uh, Confianza Pro 12 was really going horizontally in many different directions, but I knew very, very clearly from the CT what the angle of the vessel should be. And so it gave me that additional confidence that when I knew I needed to knuckle, I had an expectation of where the knuckle was going to be because you're not always fortunate enough to have calcium line every single CTO where you can see it on fluoroscopy. So both for the calcium and for the angle of the main branch entry, it's been very helpful. So, so Bill, once you confirm here, we may actually cut out for a few minutes. We have uh, Farouk has to give a little presentation as well as me. So once you confirm, maybe it's okay with you. We'll take a few minutes break, let you work on uh, predilating and then come back to you. But I want to see if you're, if you're in and then we'll take maybe a few minutes break. I'll try to have it. I just said to you guys, it's fine. Take a break you need. It's all good. Yeah, I think, I think let me, let's see the injection, see if the wire is okay. I think, I think, we're, we're, I think you're across as you said. And then after that, we'll take a five minutes break um, to go over the presentation. That's high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really. Is he having any pain? You know, sometimes they, they want to urinate. I mean, you're, I think Tom makes a great point. Sometimes people get uncomfortable, they have a pain somewhere, they cannot urinate full bladder. That's a great point that maybe it's uh, something else going on. DKD is a little acid depression, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so Mark's going to step out here. I just want to thank him. It's great. I got to tell you, he's my boss. And as you guys all know, me having to manage me. <laughs> Everybody should the hog mark every time you see so, so, Bill, it looks like the EKG might have a little depressions there, maybe the balloon or, yeah, maybe the, or, the, or, the, or the hyper blood pressure. Bill, Bill, uh, oh, Bill, you went with the workhorse wire. You had your, at some point, you had your Corsair uh, down or whatever, microcatheter. I used to say uh, we should never do a distal injection, but in the era of contrast guided, there's a section reentry and stuff. I've started you know, doing a little more uh, distal injection, and sometimes you see the distal vessel, boom, you're done, and that's it. Why don't you think? Yeah, I, I feel so comfortable with the wire feel. Perfect. So, so, we'll see. We'll hide this here. So, so, Bill, we'll take a little, yeah, we'll take a little break. Maybe yeah, we'll go to the talk, and we'll be right back with you. So we'll go to, the, to um, uh, Dr. Jaffer. So Farouk Jaffer will present some uh, advanced uh, retrograde rapid shooting, and then we'll come back uh, to the University of Washington. Yeah. So thanks, Farouk. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, this is um, really a wonderful forum to be a part of, and thank you, Manos, and to the organizing committee for um, inviting me and getting to be a part of this. It really is great. So we're going to talk about just uh, some advanced retrograde troubleshooting options. Um, it's important to, to really go through this methodology in great detail and to have a um, game plan for each of the problems that one can face. And while we didn't see um, a real retrograde case just now, some of the issues with anagrade ambiguity are actually relevant for the retrograde option as well, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. So like any kind of complicated procedure, there are systematic problems that arise. And in general, uh, having a systematic approach to understand them and address them can really lead to long-term success. And because this is such an important technique, um, it is important to look at each of the, one of these uh, types of um, complications and limitations and have a protocol for addressing them. So many problems um, that we can really um, uh, experience when we're trying to start our retrograde approaches and when we start to do more advanced work, but some of these are, are applicable um, throughout. So identifying a good collateral. This often is because we have incomplete angiography. It takes often a very careful film review um, over multiple periods in time. I look at films 20, 30 minutes, and I do it on separate days, and I try to take some notes, and I'll identify a pathway, um, and I'll come back and look at it and think maybe it's not as important as another option. Um, can't access the target collateral, so sometimes we think something is really promising, but we can't get our gear there. We can't wire the target collateral, this is a, and how do we actually address and whether or not that's um, choosing different collaterals or choosing different wires. Cannot class uh, the collateral with a microcatheter. What are our, our options here? Um, if we're able to actually traverse the uh, collateral, get to the distal cap, but we can't make progress, what are our steps to try to attack this? Um, every now and then we're making progress, but sometimes we're lost retrograde. We can't actually tell where we are. How do we figure this out? Um, if we're in a position now to 
to a complete reverse cart. Sometimes there are many factors that lead us to not be able to do that. Um, and one of the other problems um, that can, of course, be important for, for completing reverse cart, which is the primary mode of retrograde PCI solutions, is that we can't get going anagrade. And as we saw uh, what Bill was demonstrating, that takes um, a lot of careful um, understanding of the anatomy and architecture. And one other uh, problem that we can often have, um, both um, in anagrade and retrograde cases, is not being able to get past an occluded stent. What are options there? And then finally, there are serious complications um, that occur with retrograde PCI. Um, knowing how to manage them is an important aspect. So um, I'll put this in the frame of a, a recent case um, that we had of a, a gentleman who had um, severe angina with a post-cabbage um, right coronary artery, total occlusion. Um, he had a patent lima and failed vein grafts, diabetes, creatinine of 1.5. His um, uh, distal uh, right coronary um, was really dominated by a posterior left ventricular branch, um, and there was a PDA branch that it actually had a prior stent. Um, let's see if the pointer doesn't seem to really work too well there, but there's um, a stent um, uh, right here. Maybe I can show the screen here. Yeah. Stent right at this um, uh, area here where the PDA is. Thanks, Moss. And so that was jailed and, and included, it was a bare metal stem from about um, 12 years ago prior to his bypass. Um, we thought that the PLV was bigger. Um, the vein graft had gone to the PDA, not the PLV, and we chose a bifemoral axis approach. And so um, one of the things that um, is an important technique to know, uh, of course, is septal surfing and crossing septals. In this particular case, we didn't really have a good septal option as most of the collaterals were to the PLV, but just to illuminate the concept of septal surfing, one of the challenges when, when people first start trying to wire septals is they can be very plotting and very dogmatic about saying maybe it's sept S1 or S2, the one that's going to actually cross. And oftentimes you find that you cannot predict which septal branch will actually cross. And this is really the strategy about being efficient and really probing in a very fast way. And Manos here, I uh, kindly shared a slide where you can really see how the wire just manipulates. And when it gets a little resistance, he may pull back and choose a different zone. Um, but there's always kind of a, a systematic, steady, um, relatively fast manipulation of this wire. It's really kind of a, a feel. And this wire, for example, is a Xi'an wire, which are these soft, um, hydrophilic, but non-polymer jacketed types of wires that can allow us to get through septal. So not over committing um, to a specific septal um, allows rapid probing of multiple different channels and success. Um, one of the other challenges that we'll face, um, and this was relevant for this particular case, was trying to cross an epicardial tortuous circumflex collateral, and that, that was the choice for this particular case. Um, it was a very hostile and a great case, um, uh, lots of calcium. There was a brief attempt, uh, but a stingray balloon could not be delivered due to the severe calcification. So a retrograde approach was used, and you can see this is a Xi'an wire. The microcatheter is set far back away from it. We do not want to weaponize these wires. We really need to let the wire find its natural curvature, make through those, get through those curves gently. And, and you can see here the tremendous amount of movement of both the catheter and wire with every heartbeat. And so if that wire is, is in any way stiffened because the microcatheter is very close to it, one can perforate. So um, a slight general slight rotation and movement can keep the micro, and keeping the microcatheter far back can allow us to cross um, these techniques and, and with a sliding mechanism. So in this particular case, um, we had faced with this distal right coronary um, stent that had been occluded for many, many years. And in an anagrade approach, we had tried to go through that stent. We could not go. Um, through it, our hope was is that we might be able to go through this retrograde, but it was impossible to penetrate this distal cap even with our stiffest wires, such as an Estado 20 gram wire. Um, now, in this situation, one of the solutions um, to this is actually to go around the stent and plan on an external stent crush. Um, as long as the stents are not overly sized and we can use IVIS to help guide, this is possible to do. And so um, um, while that was our initial approach, our microcatheter from the retrograde side could not actually make progress around that stent. And so we employed a maneuver called the Carlino um, uh, technique. And um, this was um, something that we'll show in just a moment. But just before that, just a comment about retrograde wire escalation. If this total occlusion is actually short, for example, as the one that we saw earlier, where it might have been about 15 millimeters or so, if we had chosen a primary retrograde route 
and the total occlusion is relatively short. Then using wires to do a, a wire escalation, just like we would do anagrade, can be a successful approach and avoid uh, the complexity of reverse cart and subintimal stenting. And there are a number of wires, and they, they are important to learn a few of them. But the basic concepts is that if you really know the architecture well, then taking stiff wires to penetrate um, is an acceptable approach. If the vessel course is ambiguous or the, the actual caps are ambiguous, then one needs to really res resign oneself to, to generate a knuckle, as uh, was mentioned earlier t in the case today. And so um, there are a range of different wires um, with tip, 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 tip stiffnesses, um, and the standard one that we use for um, a, a solid knuckle is the Pilot 200. In this particular case, um, we um, decided to make use because we knew by the prior distal stent exactly where the architecture was to make use of a modified Carlino maneuver. And this was uh, really to inject a very small amount of contrast through the microcatheter to actually soften and modify the tissue right around that stent because even though we were taking very stiff wires, we were bouncing off of that uh, distal zone. By allowing, creating these micro fissures, um, uh, we can now modify the actual tissue around it and wires uh, will find their way through those modifications. And so in this particular case, um, our first um, Carlino uh, maneuver allowed us to get behind the stent. You can see that the microcatheter is um, sitting right here. Thanks, Monos. Monos is, is going to be my pointer maybe. Um, go back to that one here. forward here. Yep. Yeah, so uh, on the left panel, we just show them the microcatheter. That's stuck in that first Carlino um, channel, even though the wire went through. And so um, what we did is we actually um, backed the wire out. That was a stiff wire. Backed the wire out and then injected again and created a second dissection plane. And now we're able to traverse with the microcatheter and bring a Pilot 200 up and knuckle um, retrograde. So this was one solution. Again, we are going to get stuck in these very hostile vessels, uh, especially around um, stented tissue. So using these um, types of um, advanced techniques can help um, solve some of these um, challenges. So um, uh, the next move after this was to Great. So um, uh, one of the challenges that sometimes we can face is we're moving along retrograde. We think we're, we're, we're advancing our wires, and suddenly the wire can seem incredibly off course. The integrate guide is um, here um, up in the, with that upper arrow that you see, and that was our target for the right coronary artery retrograde approach. But instead, we started deviating far away and wondered if we had perforated this vessel uh, and were suddenly... Out. And that was surprising because we had started with a, a knuckle-based approach. We had a Pilot 200, no specific resistances, and all of a sudden we're up way off. And how do we actually resolve that? So one way um, that we have uh, been exploring is actually using CT guidance ahead of time. And so uh, this concept is actually based on the fact that many patients who have complex coronary disease will end up with CT angiography. Um, we specifically will get these for some of our more complicated cases. Um, but that has a tremendous amount of information, both for the center lines, so we can actually see in between the vessel and x-ray angiography. We can see the distal cap, the proximal cap, but we can't see in between. And therefore, um, our ability to really understand where the vessel course is is magnified greatly by CT. And uh, do we need a break? You want to go back? You want to cut? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up, sure. So in this particular case, we had actually had a CT and we'd isolated the center lines ahead of time where we had mapped the prior vein graft to the RPDA and uh, the actual true native um, RCA. And you can see here very clearly that the retrograde wire was clearly tracking the vein graft. In two seconds, it's obvious that we are way off from the right coronary, but we knew, for example, that we weren't suddenly extra, extra coronary and outside the heart. So we pulled our wire back, redirected, and you can see how in, the, in the bottom left panel that the wire is now pulled back, and then the D panel is now going up the center line, and you can, you can do this. So this is a real C time, C, a real fusion of real time CT fusion of CT and X ray angiography. And so, um, um, our next um, uh, concept that we can face, and we try to do this where we set up going anagrade first because now our focus is, is uh, once we've knuckled retrograde to start our planning for reverse cart, is that there are many times where we can't get going anagrade, and that can be because the anagrade cap is very hard or ambiguous. 
So we talked about some of these techniques earlier. Can we actually um, scratch uh, the tissue, create intentional dissection? Can we use balloon-assisted subintimal entry in order to get in and around um, the actual uh, proximal cap? The other um, opportunity that one can use is, is to actually push the retrograde knuckle all the way to the proximal cap, and that allows one to define the proximal cap and now have a target for going inward from the anagrade side. There are other approaches such as CT and then using Carlino and laser modifications to modify the proximal cap to allow entry of wires. An anchor balloon um, can also um, help in these situations. So um, this is a case um, that Bobby A. Uh, lent to me, just showing the ability of a retrograde cap, uh, uh, to a, a retrograde approach to allow us to get to the proximal cap. Then he, he used the knuckle to basically define the proximal cap, brought the anagrade microcatheter right to the tip, injected with a Carlino maneuver to really expand that space, and you can see on the right panel how the, the, micro, the, the knuckle slides right down, and then he was able to complete reverse cart. Um, finally, I'll, and I'll probably I should just expedite so we can get back to the live case, um, is that um, if we cannot get retro, extra reverse cart to work, it's often because we have an undersized balloon. I'm using a, um, a larger balloon, using guide extension catheters. Um, these are all systematic types of um, problems that we can solve. IVIS can be helpful. Snaring can be helpful other types of approaches and happy to talk about this afterwards. But um, ultimately we were able to reverse cart in this situation and um, uh, complete the case in, with uh, subintimal stenting around. So just to conclude here is that, um, and, the, and this is actually a durable result and the vessels can grow as we saw and alluded to earlier. So it's a highly effective method, the retrograde PCI approach. Challenges that are faced can be systematically classified and tackled. And um, with that, I'm glad to uh, have the chance to present. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks very much, Rogue. That's excellent, and we'll now go back to Bill. Hey, Bill. Yeah. We're back again. So I'm, I'm in a, you know, I'll show you the picture. So the thing to, to look at here is when we look at our setup shot, it's almost as Mark was talking about, it's like a co PA. There's a small branch out, and then there's a couple tiny branches. So it's not a huge outflow territory. So we went in, we re entered, we extended it. And I just, I'm, right now, we're just doing a little bit of a massage while I was waiting for you guys. It's one of those, it's going to be one of those where the, the flow is not, so there's the retrograde, there's no collaterals. Those are finally in the LED, or actually I'll show you here in a second. So I do an animated puff here in a second, eventually, there you go. So wires in one branch, there's flow out in the other branch, so, but it's not one of those like, wow, that looks great. You see one branch coming from the collaterals. So we stent it, and the flows, Okay, just now you just like got a three five stents into a you know a small outflow target. So I tried a little massage. I'm gonna give a little down. We'll give some more nitro here, and then and I've lost my acute marginals even though I tried to keep them. Um, so it's one of those. It's gonna be less than beautiful, but you know if we look at open CTO, what we found is we have the same at least symptomatic benefit of Timmy two and Timmy three flow. That a lot of times. It takes a little bit for these vessels to get going again, um, just because you're fighting competitive flow from the collaterals. So that's what I'm probably going to end up sort of hoping. Uh, and also I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, so I wish it looked better for you guys, but I'm going to get what I get, unfortunately. Everybody can tell me I should have gone retrograde in the first place. And, and, and Bill, I think it's a small vessel, as you say, and sometimes if you let it go and, and, and wait for a few weeks or months, then that's going to grow and it's going to be fine. Uh, as well. So I don't know, maybe check the panel. Would you do more things right now? Would just, uh, just give it a little nitro and let it be? Maybe you can just mean her. You get competitive flow out there. Man, anybody? I don't know what's right. I mean, that's the hard part of a lot of this stuff is we have to often make it up as we go. Well, I'll tell you, my feeling is I think you've got clearly distal true lumen. You have outflow in the two vessels. It could be many different things, could be mobilization, who knows, but I think you cut a good outflow, now's the time to let it be, and, and the patient is doing okay, I presume, he's doing okay, no um, other uh, comments? Bill? Bill, have you delivered your, uh, your, uh, your drug through, let's say, microcatheter, very distal, have you tried that? No, I haven't done that yet, I can try that. 
Sometimes, sometimes it make a difference. You bring you, 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 you drop it really, really distal and wait a bit at the time. And sometimes it's a bit of a, you know, embolization, hematoma, and everything it resolves. And, uh, and Bill, your your LAD was a big wrap around LAD. So a small, it's a small, a small right. PDA with a wrap around LAD. You're not going to get a big PDA out of this case. Yeah. No, Bill, I think that was an awesome case, and I think many different uh, learning tips and tricks for everyone. Um, you had uh, some start there. You had uh, a dissexual reentry stingray coming up. Um, I think it was a perfect case, and the patient got essentially completely revascularized right now. Yeah, so I think he's... FFR of the diagonal at some point, otherwise I'm in good shape. Yeah, so I think he's going to feel much, much better. He's completely revascularized. That's not to go away. I think it's a perfect result. Yeah, so I just, I mean, the, I guess for me the teaching points I want from the audience are you know, our profession at times tends to make comments like it can't be fixed. And I think we've got to get away from those things that they can be fixed. Um, the second is, is that you've got to keep yourself continually evolving, learning, and adding new tricks. And really come to procedures with a series of algorithms, not expecting the first one to work, but having several to back you up to help you get successful. I think those are Two things I, I, I hope people got as we went through this case. We never got stalled. We continue to sort of evolve and use our technologies to move forward. The other thing I'd be remiss to, to do if I don't get it is just want to say happy birthday to Marisa. I heard he, his birthday was last week. I'm sure he turned 32 or 1. <laughs> um, hopefully he had a good time down in Miami Beach uh, for his birthday. Great, Bill. Well, again, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal case. Really appreciate it. Strong work. And in the last few minutes, uh, we're going to finish with Dr. Ming Vo, who will discuss about resolving proximal carambiguity. Ming, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Just got to wait for this. Okay, so if you look at the progress CTO registry, approximately one third of CTOs that are intervened on will have proximal cap ambiguity. And that's data from the progress CTO uh, registry. Uh, as well as uh, published by Manos and his group. The main problem with proximal cap ambiguity, as you have seen from, from the case recently, is that it can lower your success rate by almost 10%. And it makes your procedure more complex by prolonging procedure and forces you to use more contrast and radiation. But fortunately, these kind of lesions, proximal cap ambiguity lesions, do not increase your uh, complication rate. So the main impact of proximal cap ambiguity is the fact that it is the highest predictor of uh, technical failure. This is the progress CTO score uh, data. So today we'll go through solutions, and I'll be very brief. I'm just going to show you each of these solutions by case examples in isolation, and at the end, put everything together into a mini algorithm under the larger hybrid algorithm. So calcium outline. So this is a very simple, uh, basic case. You can look at the uh, LED. When contrast goes in, you really don't know where the cap is. But when you follow the calcium outline, you have a sense of where the actual cap of the LED is. And because we knew where the cap was, it's no longer ambiguous. We deflected a Pro-12 off a balloon, off a diagonal branch, got sub-intimal, then just did a standard uh, ADR with stick and swap to uh, revascularize this uh, artery. IVAS can be very important uh, during a case, so especially during uh, when you're doing the case. What you can do is advance an IVAS, and I'll show you what a cap looks like under IVAS. This is an LED CTO. You really don't know where the cap is. What you're seeing is the diagonal branch, but where is the cap of the LED? So we advance a wire on the diagonal branch, advance the IVAS on that diagonal branch, and perform IVAS. At 7 o'clock, there is what the cap looks like. I'm pulling back now, I'll continue to pull back into the proximal LED. There, you don't see the cap anymore. It's just the LED itself. Advance it a bit further just to ensure that I know exactly where the cap is, and that's what a stump looks like on IVAS. Once you know where it is, I left the IVAS in place just to mark where it is, uh, then engage the cap with the Pro-12, got in the cap, and once in the cap, advance the base of operation, this particular case, the Corsair, just into the cap, not go to maintain vessel architecture, and thereafter spun the cross boss. And fortunately, the cross boss actually went true lumen by uh, a workhorse, by advancing your workhorse, you feel there's no resistance, you're back in true lumen, and therefore solve proximal cap ambiguity with the IVIS. Now, Farouk Jaffer is a world expert on CT scan and overlay, 
And I'll just show you what I've done. It's not uh, the best example, but it's a nice example to show you what uh, can be done. So this is a circumflex occlusion. Again, you really don't know where the cap is. We attempted to do uh, retrograde. We could not cross the collateral. Uh, therefore, we uh, tried to advance the IVIS like the previous case. We could not because of the uh, tortuosity. So we took the patient off the table, did a scan. This is not the perfect uh, reconstruction, but it's good enough to show me where the cap is. Once I know, knew where the cap was, I took the patient back to the lab blindly with the Pro-12 and trusting the uh, CT scan findings, I stuck the uh, Pro-12 into where the cap's supposed to be. Thereafter, advanced a, uh, the Corsair right into the cap again and was able to wire the distal vasculature true lumen with the power 200, then tapped out the, uh, the bifurcation. The move the cap technique, uh, again, as uh, we alluded to during the live case, is a very important technique. And in this technique, instead of engaging the actual cap, you engage the proximal uh, part of the vessel uh, and move that cap more proximally, call a virtual cap. You get into the subdermal space, advance a microcatheter, track the vessel architecture with a pilot again, and re-enter distally. And this case shows you uh, uh, the scratch and go aspect of the cap rather than the base. So this is an RCA uh, lesion. What we did was we, uh, with penetration techniques, all I do is push, not drill, push with the Pro-12 into the subintimal space. You can see with contrast, the tip is in the subintimal space. Thereafter, leave that wire there and advance your Corsair on this wire. So this, uh, this requires meticulous manipulation of wire and Corsair. Once there, perform knuckle again to track the vessel architecture and perform dissection reentry to get back. Finally, again, with the discussion from this case, is retrograde can sort out proximal cap ambiguity, and I'll show you a nice case of that. This is a OM occlusion. Again, we don't know where the cap is, so we went retrograde through a epicardial collateral from an OM to OM, crossed with the Xion wire, and subsequently you could see the retrograde knuckle XT. Now it goes exactly to where the proximal cap is supposed to be. So again, that's the XT knuckle. It shows you where the proximal cap is. Once we knew where it was, we left the retrograde gear in place, advanced the anterograde gear, a turnpike LP, this particular case, to where the cap's supposed to be, engaged the cap with the pad 200, wired it distally into the true lumen, subsequently treated this, again, proximal cap uh, OM. So overall, uh, let's put everything together. Those are isolated uh, solutions. So how do you put this together in your practice? So when you're faced with the proximal cap, again, one third of your CTOs will have this. The hyper algorithm tells us to go retrograde, but as you could see, retrograde 20% of the time, you cannot, you do not have the ability to cross the collateral. So you need anti-grade options. So what you do and what I've done is CT scan my patients, uh, not all my patients, as Farouk does, I see to the ones that I think is gonna have difficulty retrograde. CT scan, prepare them. If that's unsuccessful or not, not helpful, I would then do an IVIS during the case to identify the cap. If that's not helpful, unsuccessful, I would then move on to more complicated techniques such as move the cap. So overall, you can see that for sure, proximal cap I'm giving makes the case very difficult as you see uh, just the case just now. And in order to improve your success rate, we talked about the solutions uh, during this uh, lecture as well as well as during the live case. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. again. Thank you all for being there. I think we're perfectly on time, actually. So thanks again for a great session. At 3.30, we'll have actually a session going over all the basics of CTO-PCI, starting from undergrade, retrograde, covering all aspects that um, uh, will be chaired by uh, Stefan Rifre and, um, and Tony Speedy. And then uh, just a correction on the program. Actually, the symposium on atherectomy, the CSI symposium, will be at 6 o'clock here, not at 7 o'clock as it's seen on the program, 6 p.m. over here. Uh, so it would be great if you guys are interested in that as well. So thank you again so much for being here.